another uh, Triumph Palace live event. I'm Lindy Cummings. I'm the research historian here at the Palace and I'm going to be giving you a sneak peek into a couple of items from our archives. Uh, what is an archive? Well, it can be an organization, it can be a building or a place, or it can be a set of documents. So an example would be an organization um, that's designed to collect things. Uh, the National Records Administration is a good example of that, but that also is a place. Uh, the National Archives and Records Administration is an actual building, and inside that building there are collections, which are individually kind of known as archives or collectively as archives. Um, what's typically in an archive? Well, uh, books, newspapers, photographs, uh, ticket stubs, um, anything that you're collecting that's more paper-based, typically paper-based uh, object uh, can be found in an archives. Letters, um, posters, just many different things. Um, so here at the palace, for example, our archives contains uh, primarily two groups of um, collections. One is related to our institutional collection. Uh, so documents that would relate to the construction of the palace uh, when it was uh, you know, being worked on in the 1950s and 1960s. And then we have documents clear up into the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. So relatively recent items can also be part of an archive. Uh, we also have a group of documents related to the federal occupation of Newburgh during the Civil War. Those are probably our two biggest collections. And then we have a collection of books, mostly from the 18th century, some from the 19th century, some letters, uh, newsprint, and some other ephemera related to different things. Some to the, the history of the state, some to the history of our city. So uh, one thing that we do not have that I get a lot of questions about is what type of resources do we have for genealogical work? And unfortunately, our archives really don't have a lot of information that would be useful to someone who's researching their particular family history, unless we have a document that was written by one of your ancestors, um, potentially a, a soldier who served here during the Civil War, something like that. Uh, we do have other resources for uh, genealogical research, um, but the archives are not a terribly good res a resource for that. Um, you can make a, 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 um, a, a research request that I can try to answer, or you can set up a visit. I'm happy to set up visits once the governor has deemed that it is safe for state sites to reopen and resume our business as we would normally conduct it. Um, so that's, that's always a possibility. So for today we're going to look at four different items. We're going to look at a book from the 1760s. We're going to look at a letter from the 1780s. We're going to look at a sketchbook from the 1860s. And we're going to look at a scrapbook from the 1940s. If at any point you have a question about one of these documents, you can uh, drop a question into the comments box next to this live presentation. Uh, I do want to note that uh, this is an archives. I'm going to be talking about archives. I am not myself a trained archivist. There are people who go to school for a minimum of two years to train to be archivists, digital archivists, archivists who specialize in photographs or paper or books. Uh, I have a, a basics uh, course in archives. I'm more the custodian of our archives. So if you have an archive specific question, like what does an archivist do or how does an archivist train, um, I'm happy to answer those. I can send you some resources. There's a couple of good websites. And uh, you can contact me at my email, lindy.cummings at ncdcr.gov, and I can send those your way. Um, it, is a, it is a career option, believe it or not. Um, one of the things that you're going to notice is today I'm wearing nitro gloves. Uh, these are to protect the items from the oils in my skin. Typically when you go to an archives and you're working with older documents, you actually just want to practice uh, what we would consider basic uh, hygiene. You want to wash your hands really thoroughly so that your skin is very clean. The reason being the dirt and oils on our fingers can transfer to the paper and the leather or whatever material that the uh, archival object is made out of 
and we want to uh, prevent that as much as possible. Today I'm going to be using Nitro gloves because I'm going to be handling one of the books uh, myself, uh, but normally just a good hand washing is sufficient. All right, so let's get started here. And I'm going to take over from Ra. Thank you. All right, so here is our first object. This is a leather bound book of common prayer, the rule of prayer, published in the 1760s. And I'm going to move right here. I've got a um, lead snake weight. This is a weighted string, basically like a long shoe string, and it holds my pages back. So I'll show you the cover here. This is the cover of this book. It's actually a very large book if you look at it. And I've got some foam support so that we're putting as the least amount of stress on the spine. This book is in such good condition that I am guessing it was rebound at some point. So I'm going to replace my snake weights. You're going to get a nice close-up of that page. Also, you'll notice here next to my snake weight, I've got a little... Um, some watermarks along the page. So the book's had some damage. This is the title page. You'll notice it's not in great condition. Uh, it has had some conservation done to it to kind of stabilize these areas where you can see sections have been torn out. But you can still read it pretty well. Um, we're missing here the top of it, but it uh, basically, the remaining words, you can kind of guess what they are, and it's gift of the society for the propagation of the gospel in foreign parts, and it was given for the use of the chapels in North Carolina. Uh, a gift of His Excellency William Tryon uh, by use of the society parish in Bertie County, North Carolina. So this particular rule of prayer was for a Anglican parish in Bertie County. Uh, all the royal governors were rather appalled at the laxity in religious observance in North Carolina, and William Tryon uh, himself was uh, really committed to making sure that um, parishes grew, that they had ministers in them, and that they had the proper uh, services, service books and uh, other things to conduct religious observation or observances so you can see here just getting a little bit closer it's just the script is beautiful and it's got some kind of faded embellishments over here you can see up here you can kind of see the the texture of the paper and the way that it's been infilled so we're going to turn the page here uh the inside here i'm going to move my snake weight somebody has made some notes all kinds of notes. They're very difficult to make out, but there's one here that it's, uh, William Campbell was born December 28th, and then the date's missing, so I don't know what date he was born, but he was the uh, son of John and, it looks like, Celia Campbell. John and Celia Campbell. And so there's some other notes. These notes actually, down here actually look like somebody's been keeping accounts. So there's uh, actual dates and then amounts. So and someone's been using it as kind of a personal account book. And then down here it says someone died on May 1807. So very interesting. Here's the contents of the book. And this actually tells us a lot about what was important to people going to church in the 18th century, mid 18th century. We've got your services. Um, you've got basically a schedule, what you're supposed to read and when. And then over here we have special prayers. So you might have a, a form of prayer for the 30th day of January being the day kept in memory of the martyrdom of King Charles I. So of course King Charles I was deposed and d beheaded. And then there's another one that's uh, for a celebration of His Majesty when he came to reign. That His Majesty that they're referring to is George III, and we know that because if we turn back here, there's actually this, George R., George Rex, 
and it's given at the Court of St. James on the 7th day of October, 1761. In the first year of our reign, I believe that says first. We're going to move this. First year of our reign, by his majesty's command in Butte. Butte was the prime minister. And you can see here, I'm going to just kind of tip my camera. More conservation that's been done. This is a little bit better. All right. So that is the book of prayer. Now, how it ended up in our collection, I'm not really sure. I, I assume it was probably a gift. This is a, uh, has a very early accession number, 1964. And during that period, a lot of our items were gifts from people who were interested in the palace. We still receive a lot of our items as gifts. It's very important. All right. The next thing we're gonna look at is a letter. And I just love this letter. This tells us so much about children and families, and it's kind of coded, but we'll kind of look at it closely here. This is not quite an eight by 10 sheet. It's a little bit larger than a five by seven. And as you can see, we've got some fragmentation on the edges but it's still in remarkable condition. And the script is a little faded, but still quite clear. And I, th you can tell just how beautiful this script is. I cannot even write this nicely. This is, this is somebody who's been taking a lot of time with their hand work and their penmanship. So this letter reads, my dear, honored, etc., Mama, with pleasure I embrace this opportunity of writing to you. I receive the pocketbook and the money by Mr. Sears, for which I am very much obliged to you and shall try to learn very fast to be deserving of it. And she's actually smell, spelled deserving a little bit differently than we do today. It's, it's interesting to know that in the 18th century, spelling was not yet standardized, so there can be some very creative spellings. I hope, the letter continues, I hope I shall have the happiness of seeing my dear mama and papa this summer and my brothers. I wish very much to see my little brother. Give my love to my brother Dickie and to Jemmy and my duty to papa. I am my dear mama's most dutiful, affectionate daughter, Anne Stanley, Philadelphia, June 10th, 1784. So this Anne Stanley is the daughter of John Wright and Anne Cogdell Stanley. And if you have been in the Stanley home, you have seen a picture of young Anne. She is uh, painted in a portrait with her older brother, John Stanley of the famed Stanley Spate duel in the uh, 19th century, in which former Governor Spate died. But Anne was John's sister, younger sister, and they are painted together with their pet deer. So next time you're in the Stanley house, you'll want to look for that portrait. It it's in, hangs in the parlor. But they spent a great deal of time in Philadelphia. That's why her letter is dated from Philadelphia. And we presume she was probably educated there. It was not uncommon at all for young ladies to be sent by their parents to be educated in uh, fine accomplishments like penmanship, which you see here. She's a beautiful writer. And they would also be educated in music and uh, sometimes in more masculine, what we would consider more masculine subjects for the 18th century mathematics, spelling, geography, uh, things like that. And so the one of the most fascinating things is when you look at how beautifully this letter is written and how formal the tone is, Anne was only nine years old when she wrote this. Can you imagine today you're a nine-year-old writing a letter that begins, my dear and honored mama and ends with my duty to papa? And this really tells us something about childhood in the 18th century. Uh, childhood as a distinct period that we imagine it today where you play and you develop and you have a lot of fun. Uh, that's not really childhood of the 18th century. Children were considered little adults 
and they conducted themselves as so. And your parents, you were supposed to extend a lot of deference and respect to your parents, and we certainly see that in her letter. So her little brothers that she asks to be remembered to and she wants to see them, those brothers were John, Richard, and of course a diminutive of Richard is Dickie, and she says she wants to send her love to Dickie, and James, J uh, James Green Stanley, and a diminutive of James is Jemmy, so she sent her love to Jemmy, and the little brother that she refers to is Thomas, and he was just a year old when she wrote this letter. Uh, Anne's parents, John Wright and Anne, uh, they only lived about five years longer after uh, their daughter wrote this letter to them. They both perished of yellow fever in 1789, and Anne and all of her six surviving siblings were orphaned. So it's kind of a sad note to this letter, but um, it's, it's a sweet little note nonetheless. All right, so now we're gonna move on to our next item, and this is really a great piece. This is a sketchbook from the 17, or sorry, the 1860s. It's uh, one of our items that represents the period of federal occupation in New Bern during the Civil War. And you can see here, it's got a nice blue cover, very bright, with leather binding on the spine in the corners. And it says sketchbook, hand lettered on the front. And we're gonna open this sketchbook. And here is an inscription, Fred W. Smith, Number two, Albion Street, Boston, Massachusetts. And here in the corner it says, Company C, 44th Massachusetts, MVM. So the Massachusetts Volunteer uh, Militia. It was an infantry regiment. So he's inscribed his book. He's also added another, this is a very fancy inscription. You can see he's put a lot of care. It's, it's done in pencil. And then over here, he's also written, here we go fly leaf, uh, his address again. So in case, you know, kind of like today, if you lose something, someone can return it to you. Or in this case, he probably put his address in it in case he was killed and someone would know to send it to his family. So we're just gonna start thumbing through. This is the most wonderful sketchbook. So here, a uh, little bit about the 44th. They were must, so the Battle of New Bern was in March of uh, 1862. And this particular unit of the 44th, that they were mustered in in September of that same year, September 1862. And in October, they were sent down to New Bern. So they were part of the force that occupied the city. They were not part of the force that participated in the battle. So when he's sketching, he's sketching scenes of the occupation. So here's a stable. You can see it's just a wonderful pencil sketch. There's a little hitching post here in the corner and looks like some bales of hay, and he's labeled it the stable, 44th Mass, New Bern, NC. And of course, New Bern is spelled the old-fashioned way without a space between the W and the B, all one word, New Bern. Sometimes you see it spelled with an E on the end. Here's another sketch that he's done. This one is pencil with what looks like a watercolor pencil addition. And it's a river scene. You can see, looks like a um, lighthouse out there in the distance. This book doesn't like to open up very well, so I'm trying to be very careful with the pages. Our quartermasters. So this is the quartermasters' uh, office. It appears to be on the river bank. There's a little ship and a tree, and this is for the 44th in New Bern. Ah, here is our guardian angel, it says. This is a steamboat, an armed steamboat on the Noose River, and it's the series. That's the title. As you can see, he's got like kind of a nice red and blue penciled border on that. And then just, I mean, just an incredible detail. This looks more like me. He's had a little, um, added a little ink to his sketch, mostly pencil and colored pencil, but little ink. Ah, here's an interesting one. Our Jeff the Boot Black from Boston. So here is a man who has, uh, it looks like enlisted in the unit. He is African American. Also from, labeled at New Bern. Another sketch. 
I think here, for the next couple of pages, he's sketching scenes around Salem, New Hampshire. And I think we can read this as a little bit of homesickness kicking in. He's thinking about the places that he knew as either a young man or a boy and um, spending some time sketching them from memory, of course. So this is a pencil sketch of the old farm. Here's another one, Policy Pond. And so there's uh, actually, you can see a boy headed down to do some fishing. Maybe that's Fred sketching himself going down to fish as a boy. Turn the page here. Uh, here's another scene, the birch on Policy Pond. This is one of my favorites. I just, I love this one with the boat tied up to this tree on a rocky bank. Just a beautiful scene. Ah, this one's fun. Army Indispensables. You must have a pipe and you must have your tobacco. Apparently this is an essential in a kit for a soldier. Another scene around Policy Pond. He really likes these scenes around Policy Pond. And I love, this one's really fun. Here is... A gentleman and a lady and this one's not labeled so I assume it's policy pond because the rest of his were policy pond maybe he's thinking about a, a, a sweetheart or uh, someone that he loved and I see a little farm in the distance and some cattle grazing on a hill all right more scenes under the elms a swing kind of speaks to childhood and the old barn maybe where he did you know, did his chores every day on the family farm. And, all right, so there's the happy cook. Just more domestic scenes. And then we get back to the occupation. So here's down the river. Here's a boat sailing down the river, probably the Noose River. And this one's interesting. This one's labeled the old slave in his studies. So here is what we can assume is a formerly enslaved person uh, teaching himself to read or actually reading because maybe he was taught as a younger child. And this was not something that was allowed. Uh, the South had enacted strict literacy rules uh, in about the um, uh, early 19th century um, because they didn't want enslaved people to be able to read, to inform themselves or to know what was happening or to understand things about revolts. And so reading was an act of rebellion. So here's a man who is now able to read freely. And uh, that's, it's really interesting commentary. All right. I'm just going to kind of slip. This is from um, Little Washington, the old Tar River. So the 44th was primarily uh, occupying New Bern, but they also did participate in some uh, excursions out and some battles. And uh, this one at Little Washington was a particular one that the 44th was engaged in. So he's apparently, I'm going to guess this is probably after the battle, and he's sketching. Here's another one. He, he just, they're just beautiful. All right, I'm gonna, there's a couple that are Camp Migs. This is a military camp. Comfortable quarters. Oh, yes, this is comfortable quarters, apparently, hiding under a cart probably from the rain i think he's got some some pencil strokes here that are meant to represent rain all right and then i'm going to flip to the back here to one that i think anybody who has visited new Bern or is a citizen of new Bern will recognize this i'm gonna get a close-up of the pages there sorry this is a familiar one cedar grove cemetery just a very detailed sketch with some colored pencil. You can see the headstones and then of course the gates, entrance gates. Looks remarkably similar to today except maybe we don't have a cabin sitting off to that side. The cemetery has expanded somewhat. So those are just some of the wonderful sketches that are in this book. Uh, here he's out foraging. So he's been out or someone has been out uh, finding some extra food and 
Oh, it's bringing back a duck. That'll make some good eating. Roasted over a campfire. Here again, he's back to being homesick. He's uh, thinking about the mill in, looks like Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So he's thinking about home again. And then there's some blank pages, but it's just a really wonderful little sketchbook. Um, you can tell a lot about what someone's thinking and the things that they think are important by what they choose to draw. All right, moving on. So this is a item from our institutional collections. It is a sketchbook, I'm sorry, scrapbook. Uh, it has a wooden cover. This is made of a thin, I'm going to guess like some type of a pine with um, brass hinges and also post bound. So we've got post binding and then a gold cord uh, strung through that post, the post holes. These uh, are hand painted, very precise. And then we have a postcard pasted on the front and it's signed Gertrude Carraway, or G. Carraway. And this particular postcard is the Tryon Palace, New Bern, North Carolina. Now, if you look at that carefully, uh, you'll notice a difference. This is not the palace that we know today. Uh, for starters, if you notice this front door, we have a higher set of steps, and the portico, or the uh, colonnade here, is open straight through to the trees. And look at these third story windows. Uh, and then we'll look here at the date on this book. This book dates to about 1939, or at least it was started maybe around then, I'm not sure. Um, so that tells us something about this sketch of the palace. When Gertrude Carraway was starting to put this scrapbook together, the palace had not been constructed. And in fact, in 1939, they weren't even sure what the palace looked like. So this here is actually a conjectural drawing based on two 19th century illustrations from a, a pictorial handbook to the American Revolution published by a gentleman named Benson J. Lossing. And Lossing had known the grandson of John Hawkes, who happened to have in his own personal papers some early drawings of the palace that were never used for construction. And so um, Lossing had based his illustrations of the palace on those early papers. And so those were the only images of the palace that anyone knew about in the early 20th century. And so that's why you see the difference. It's very similar. You can see the pediment. That is very similar to the building today. The flanking kitchen and stable offices, of course, very similar, but just some differences, some key differences that tell us that this is before they discovered the final set of drawings. All right, we are going to open this book up. This is a large book, larger than 11 by 14. It's probably by 18, roughly. Right here in the center, um, first page is something that would have been very, very important to Gertrude. Uh, this is her certificate of nomination to be a member of the Tryon Palace Commission, and it is dated um, 1945, October 25th, 1945, and it is signed by R. Greg Cherry, the governor, and by the Secretary of State. And it was a great honor to be appointed to the commission. This was the uh, uh, group that was tasked with reconstructing the palace, guiding the reconstruction. So she's got that on the first page of this scrapbook, so very special. Then we've got this page, which I just love. Home of the royal governors in North Carolina, colonial capital and first state capital. Here she's got another one of those conjectural sketches you can see here, same one that she's got on the cover. And she's got built 1767 to 1770, Main part destroyed by fire, 1798. Only one wing still standing, and that was the stable wing. And then it says down here, the Athens of North Carolina, second oldest town in the state, New Bern. It's kind of a nice title page. And this is here. This is 
kind of uh, Gertrude keeping track of some of the work she'd done. Discovery of Trium Palace drawings may lead to restoration as museum. This is actually a piece uh, by Gertrude herself. She was a prolific journalist in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. She wrote for the Associated Press, and so this is one of her columns. She was also a tireless champion of the palace reconstruction and focused a lot of her writing efforts on bringing attention to the building in its history. So here she's talking about how she tracked down, with help, tracked down original palace plans that were housed at the New York Historical Society. And those actually were not the final palace plans. There was a final set that was later on discovered in the National Archives in Great Britain, and then a set after that in Caracas, Venezuela. So original plan palace received here. One of the things that his, that archivists are always concerned about is the acidity in newsprint. And you can see here, this is basically a shadow of the piece that's on the previous page. And it's because of the acid in the newsprint. And she's pasted this down with something. Um, most of the pastes that were used were acidic and will eventually kind of break down the document or break down the page or um, are very difficult to remove. So in an ideal situation, an archivist would remove these and store these separately after making really quality digital copies. But in this case, these are so adhered to the page, there's no removing them. So we try to preserve this as it is and um, usually interleave it maybe with some non-acidic paper. So here we have Tryon Restoration. This is from the New York Times. I mean, that's a big deal right there. This one is really interesting. News and Observer from 1939. Newburn was given copies of plans, photostatic copies made of original drawings for Tryon Palace. So here's a nice piece, I assume probably written by Gertrude, on the plans being given to the city. All right, oh, here we can see she's actually folded a piece of newsprint. It's too long, so it extends beyond the binding of the book, so she's actually folded this up. Here's uh, the, the mansion as it once was and the wing that may be seen now. So in the 1930s, this is how the stable office appeared, which is very different from today. And of course, during the restoration, all of those uh, additions, the, this addition and the front porch, those were all removed so that you could get back to more of the original appearance. All right, she's got lots of newsprint in here. I'm gonna kind of flip through some of the pages. There's a couple of things later on that I think are really interesting. Boy, she's got a lot of newsprint. She also uh, collected some things on the Masonic Lodge. And here's a thing on History Adds Charm, and I'm guessing that says New Bern's History Adds Charm. So we've got some buildings here um, that were important. Uh, Spate Burial Ground here is one of them. And then of course there's the stable in its uh, 1930s wrappings. And then a couple of other structures in town. All right, this is from the Secretary of the Interior of the country, and she was writing to ask for help in preserving buildings. And this is uh, the possibility of including Triumph Palace at New Bern in the program for the preservation of historic sites and buildings. This is 1935, very early. This is part of the Works Progress Administration's efforts uh, during the Great Depression, putting people to work. And there was a, a huge effort to go around and photograph and draw old buildings so that we wouldn't lose, um, lose their records. And also to uh, rebuild some buildings. And there was hope that part of work's progress would be used to reconstruct Triumph Palace. That actually did not happen. Um, not work's progress money anyway. State monies and then three large endowments from the Lathams. Uh, com completed the construction. Here's a copy of something from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And there is a 
postcard up here. And then here, keep flipping here. So these are all of her correspondence regarding the original plans. And so here is kind of that breakthrough moment in the palace, the search for palace plans, May 10th, 1939. My dear Miss Carraway, in response to your inquiry of the 8th, I am happy to be able to report that the following are preserved among the Hawks manuscripts owned by this society. And this is the New York Historical Society. And of course, confirming that indeed they have copies of early palace plans done by John Hawks. And then there's more. She, they go on. This is uh, Dorothy from the head reference. She's the head of reference department talking about what's in that collection. And there's here's another one from Dorothy. And Gertrude's clearly asking if they can have copies made. And yes, she's saying you can't take anything out of the library, but they can do they can help out. And then of course more correspondence. So this book is just nice and full. Here she's writing to Clyde Hoy, the governor, in 1939. And he says, I, will glad, I would be glad to discuss with the Highway Commission the matter of excavation under the road in New Bern. And I am sure, and the road is George Street, because of course, uh, if you know about the palace, once it burnt down, they extended George Street over the palace site. And uh, so he's saying, yes, we can think about excavating George Street. We'll only have to move an entire neighborhood, but you know, that's so easy to do. All right, more, more of her correspondence. So you can see she really uh, valued the work that she was doing. All of these wonderful letters that she kept. And we'll kind of, there's just so many of them. And here she's got uh, a list of some items that were uh, donors donors to uh, the excavation and the historical preview fund 1939 so you know people just donating a little bit here and there of course this is 39 so this is you know still part of the uh, great depression and then just all these wonderful things all right well we could keep at this all day reading newspaper titles and then you would all grow completely bored so we're going to just close this back up. I hope you enjoyed uh, getting a peek into these things. Uh, I, this is part of what makes uh, the job of the research historian or the archivist so exciting is that, you know, every day it's like, well, not every day, unfortunately, not every day. Uh, most days, some days, uh, you get these exciting views into just like a little peek into the past, a little window into the past. So here's our book and our letter and our sketchbook. All right. So, we are going to take some questions here. All right. So, I'm also going to hand our equipment back to Rob. All right. So, our questions. Let's see. Um, I'm guessing this refers to the book. Was it bound uh, or published here, or was it brought from Europe? Well, um, it was published in England for sure. Uh, publication was kind of spotty in North Carolina especially. We did have a, an official printer, official provincial printer. That was uh, James Davis at this point. Um, he did print some books and later on Newburn uh, did see a lot of book printing. Uh, but this particular book would have been printed uh, with the support of the Society for the Propagation of Gospel in the Foreign Parts, and they would have sent that over in a ship. And then at some point, it was rebound. I think I mentioned that. Um, it's in such good condition on the exterior. The leather binding is so good that I assume that it was probably rebound um, and, and conserved in some way at some point. Um, but it would have been bound, uh, printed and bound in England and then sent to the province, the province of North Carolina. Well, I hope that answers your question. All right, and then we have another one. Would the scrapbook have been part of the fundraising for the palace reconstruction? 
Um, I don't know for sure, but I can't imagine that Gertrude wasn't eager to show off her record of what was being accomplished as a way of sort of generating excitement and interest in the project. She probably didn't have to work all that hard. People were very excited about the possibility of having the palace reconstructed. Ex well, I should say, most people were. The people who lived in the neighborhood that sprang up around where the palace had been built, they were less excited, but mostly because, you know, they faced the possibility uh, and the eventual loss of their homes. Uh, so they were maybe less excited ab about that. Um, but yes, I think that, you know, it's one of those things where clearly she wants this to be remembered and to be preserved uh, in some way, this record of the process of finding palace plans. So yeah, I think that she probably would have used it to, kind of to generate some excitement. All right, so do we have any other questions? Oh my, we have lots of questions. No, just that one All right, right there. All right, here we go. Uh, my understanding is that George Street connected to James City and was the main east-west highway prior to the construction of the Cunningham Bridge. That is correct. Uh, there was a wooden bridge that basically uh, extended down George Street, ran along uh, straight down what we would consider the South Lawn today, and then over the river. Um, there are some pictures from the uh, Barber Boat site that show that old uh, bridge intact. We also have a few pictures in our own uh, archives of that bridge, and it's a, it's a wooden plank bridge. That bridge was moved, and we saw that letter from the governor where he was basically saying, yes, we can explore excavating under the street, and then as a part of that, the um, uh, state then worked to have the bridge moved so that it would free up the South Lawn to be in reinterpreted as the South Lawn. It's a monumental effort. It, you can't hardly imagine it being done today. If you think about a whole neighborhood being either picked up and moved elsewhere, um, all the properties purchased, I mean, that was a, a monumental task. So Gertrude and the women who were really interested in the reconstruction, they had a lot of, um, just a lot of energy to make sure that that came to be. There is one question that came in from Chris. The painted scrapbook. Mm -hmm. Are the dates on the NC flag inverted since you're looking at the reverse of the flag? Oh, that's a good question. Here, let me take this back here. Um, actually, it just has the state. Yeah, you're you're correct. It's so it's kind of backwards. But uh, I guess creative license, maybe artistic license. But yeah, so kind of kind of interesting. Good uh, good good observation there. Let's talk about spotting some detail. All right. So I don't know if there's, um, oh, the nature of the neighborhood, circa 1940. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, public housing to the south, manufacture to the north. Uh, that's correct. So the neighborhood that was um, on George Street, the 200 block of George Street, before the palace was reconstructed, um, one, so the homes that were built up there sprang up in the 19th century. So you had some older architecture, you had some newer, um, down towards the river, you would have had warehouses, um, working places, working buildings. There's some gas stations. Uh, one of the houses that was preserved and moved is actually the Dave's house. And if anyone's visited the palace site, the Dave's house and the Dixon house flank the entry gates to the palace. So if you're facing the palace, you've got uh, Dixon is here. And by the gates, Dixon is here and Dave's is here. Dave's used to sit... Uh, down Eaton Street, kind of on that, that part of the, of the street. And uh, that was later moved, was preserved and moved because they felt that the architecture was worth uh, preserving. If anybody's ever interested, we do have pictures of that neighborhood before it was taken down. Um, it's very interesting, kind of a mix of architecture. Um, it really looks very similar to a lot of the other neighborhoods in the vicinity, same, similar styles of homes. Um, Lots with front porches, that kind of newer vernacular style that we're familiar with. Any other questions? All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed getting a little peek at these. Um, let me know. If
around, you'd like to schedule a research visit around a particular research question that you have uh, once we are reopened, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. And again, I thank you for joining us. Uh, join us again Thursday. We'll be having another live event, I believe. What are we doing on Thursday? I'm not actually sure. So Thursday will be a surprise. Look for our posts uh, to update on you at what Thursday's uh, live tour will be for. So again, thanks for joining me and everybody have a great day.